Okay. So this is, so let, let me, um, let me try and summarize our situation. Okay, so we have a function and the function f from a to a1. And we have a sitting, b sitting inside a, and a1 sits inside b. And we put um, c0 to just b, b minus a1. In other words, the elements of B that are not in A1. Okay. And so by our definition of C0, we have B is the disjoint union of C0 and A1, which just means that C, B equals C0 union A1 and C0 intersect A1 equals the empty set. But we have the same thing happening inside A1. So we also have C1 equals B1 minus A2. And so let's see, we have B1 equals C1 union A2, C1 intersect A2 equals the empty set. And that keeps on going down, down and down, down forever and ever. So in general, we have CN equals BN minus AN plus one. Um, and BN equals CN union AN plus one, where CN intersect AN plus one is the empty set. Like that. Okay. And how does this help us? Well, we use this to define a function. So we define G from B to A1 by the rule um, G of X equals, well, we'll just put G of X equals F of X if X is in some CN for some N. And then we'll put G of X equals X if X is not in CN for um, all N. Okay, so we have to show that this is well-defined one-to-one -one and on-to. Okay, so the problems that could occur for well-defined would be if X is in CN for some N, but not in any CN for all N. Like if these, if these two conditions both held for some X, then it would be a problem because I've given two different definitions. But we see that's not a problem. Um, just by the way, I've defined it. Like you, this is like some condition and I've just given the negation of that condition. Okay. So there's no way we have like a, we have a well-defined function. There's no way we have, you know, like say two is in CN, 
but two is not in CN for any N or something. Oh, I see I've missed something in the chat, sorry. Okay. Um, that's not about this class. Uh, okay, so let's see. Okay, so at least as far as these two things go, they don't cause they don't cause us to be um, well defined. Also, we have defined uh, g of, like we've defined what g of x is for all x and b. The problem is is g of x always in a one. Okay, that would be our our main obstacle. So to check if g is well defined, we need our main x and b. Okay, but first notice that we write um, B is just the union of C0 and A1. Okay. So now we just have to check that um, G of C zero is contained in A one, and G of A one is contained in A one. Okay. Case if X is in C zero, then G of X equals F of X, because that's the definition of G. The sum n is zero. Okay. Um. So this is an element of F of B because X is in B, and f of b is just b1 and we've seen that b1 is contained in a a1 okay okay so if x is in c0 then um then f of x is in a1 our other case is that X is in A1. Then G of X is either equal to um, X or F of X. But X is in A1 and F of X is in F of A1. which is contained in F of A, which equals A1. Okay, so in any case, if X is in A1, then G of X is also in A1. So therefore G of X is in A1 for all X and B. Okay, so now I have a function from B to A1, which is well-defined and I want to check, is it one-to-one -one and is it onto? Okay, first let's suppose G of X equals G of X prime. Okay. For some X and X prime in uh, B. Okay. So there's two possibilities. Either they're both in some C or they're both not, like they're, they're not, or one is in some C and the other is not in any of the C's. Okay, so um, let's try and summarize the cases. Um, X and X, our first case is X and X prime are not in any CN where N is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, then the definition of G in this case is just that G of X equals X and G of X prime equals X prime. So the definition of G just says G of X equals X G of X prime equals X prime. Our hypothesis is that these two things are equal. That means X equals X prime. That's what we wanted to show for one-to-one. -one. So in this case where um, X and X prime are not in any of the CNs, we see that um, G is one-to-one. -one. Um, the other case is that X is in CN and X prime is in CM. Okay, 
then G, the definition of G in both of these cases is just apply, it's just F. And G of X equals F of X, G of X prime equals F of X prime. And so our assumption is that G of X equals G of X prime, but we're just saying that F of X equals F of X prime. Okay. And F is, by our hypothesis, that F is a one-to-one -one and onto function. Sorry, it's not onto. Um, F is one-to-one. -one. So X equals X prime, okay? And our last case is when X is in some CN and X prime is not in any CN. So I'll just say, I'll just write it out. X prime is not in um, CM for any M. Okay, and our hypothesis, well, then the definition of G of X is F of X. And our assumption is that G of X equals G of X prime. So F of X equals X prime. But we've shown that F of CN is just CN plus one. So therefore X prime is in CN plus one. This is a contradiction because it's not supposed to be in any CM. This is a contradiction. Okay, so G this is the last case to handle. So G is one to one. And what about on to? We want to show it's on to A1. So let Y be in A1. So either Y is in, well, we can just write this as a union. Oh, sorry. Um, why is in the union of n equals one to infinity of all the CNs? Or why is not in that union? And notice I've omitted n equals zero because remember we have B is the disjoint union of C zero and A one, okay? So C zero, if Y is in A one, then it has nothing in C zero. So Y is not in C zero, okay? Okay, so if Y is in this union, that means it's in some particular CN. So if Y is in CN for some N, well, writing CN is just F of CN minus one. Then, um, well, then there's some X in CN minus one where F of X equals Y. Okay, and then this X and CN minus one, well, G of X equals Y. Okay. On the other hand, if Y is in none of the CNs, well, then the definition of G just says G of Y equals Y. So if Y is not in any of the CNs, Then G of Y equals Y. And in that case, um, that proves that G is on to as well. So in any case, G is on to. So 
So G from B to A1 is one to one and on two. That proves that the cardinality of B is the cardinality of A1, um, which is I, by as required. Okay, so that's the end. Um, of the, the Cantor Schroeder Bernstein theorem. Um, that is, to me, it's pretty tough, but um, I hope it didn't go so badly for you. Um, So let's kind of move. Let's before um before you take a break, I just want to remind you of kind of cardinality for finite sets. And then we can talk about a few of the properties of that. So at this point, what we have is we have this idea for cardinality, and it satisfies uh basically the same properties that a um that a partial order satisfies. So, so far, what have we done? We've shown that um, cardinality of A is less than or equal to cardinality of A. We've shown the transitive law. And then we've also shown that A And this third part, that is the part that was, I would say difficult. And then the other two parts are just like prop more about, about properties of one-to-one -one functions. Okay. So now we have the symbol comparing cardinalities and it's the same symbol we have for less than or equal to, which we, you know, we also have this notion of less than or equal to for natural numbers, integers, rationals, and reals. And it better match up with the symbol we've already defined because um, let's just do an example. You have four for us, this uh, consequence of the, of the way we define what a natural number is, for us, four is a set. It is a set zero, one, two, three. And six is also a set. Six is a set zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And you see four is an element of six. So that means we define four less than six, okay? But now we also have this notion of cardinality of sets. We need to also have cardinality of four less than cardinality of six. In other words, we need to make sure that there's an injective function from four to six, but no, okay. Of course, there's an injective function from four to six. That's just, um, you know, define I from four to six by I of N equals N or N in zero, one, two, three. Okay, this gives you an injective function from four to six telling you that the cardinality of four is less than or equal to the cardinality of six. But we need to check, need to make sure there is no F from six to four. If there was, it would mean that the cardinality of six was less than or equal to the cardinality of four. And then the cantor schroeder bernstein theorem would tell us that four and six has a, have the same cardinality. That would just be not good. Um, I mean, if that happened, then we would just have to throw away cardinality or we just have to call it something different because it wouldn't be telling us about the sizes of sets, you know? 
Okay. So let me just remind you of the definitions for what it means to have cardinality n and what is a finite set. Let me just remind you. Um, if f from a, or sorry, if f from n to a is one to one and on to, we say, or we write, we define the cardinality of a to be n. And we say A is finite. If there is no, function F from N to A, no one-to-one -one and onto function F from N to A for any A or for any N, You say A is infinite. In other words, we say A is infinite when it's not finite. Okay. Okay, so example, back to our example, the cardinality of four is now four. The cardinality of six is defined to be six. But we need to check that these two cardinalities are different. Okay. Okay, so I'll just, as a last thing before the break, I'll just write down this lemma which helps us check this. Okay. Let's take a natural number. And let X be contained, but not equal to N. And there is no one-to-one -one function F from n to x. Okay. So as a corollary to this lemma, it tells us that there's no, so the natural number four is a proper subset of the natural number six. So there's no f going from six. There's no one. The cardinality of six is strictly bigger than the cardinality of four. That's what this lemma tells us. Okay, so let us now just take another seven minute break until 420. We'll pick up with this lemma and more stuff about finite cardinality. Um, so the next few things we have to talk about are like more cardinality about finite sets and then countability and uncountability and things like that. Okay, so that's is what's coming up. Okay, so see you guys in seven minutes.